Over the last two weeks, Intel has showcased through Architecture Day and Hot Chips some of its new Sapphire Rapids strategy. They've said that despite the fact that they're using tiles, this chip is going to act as if it's one big monolithic die. That's about 1600 square millimeters. What's your minimum specification? Let's start with Sapphire Rapids. The technology building blocks for this architecture have been years in the making. So if you don't follow the enterprise space, Sapphire Rapids is Intel's next generation Xeon platform. We've literally just had the launch of Ice Lake earlier this year, and Sapphire Rapids is due to come out perhaps, probably beginning of next year. But it's going to be a big step up for the company as they're going to move from a monolithic design that's using one piece of silicon into more chiplet or tile based strategy. Now, Intel here is making a distinction between chiplets and tiles, and it all comes down to how they're binding them together. So on this channel, we've spoken about Intel's multi-die interconnect bridge or EMIB, which is basically an interposer you build into your substrate, into your package, where you could put two die on top, and then there are connections between them. And it's meant to be as if there's an interposer, but you only need a very small piece of silicon to do it. With the big interposer chips, you also your interposer needs to be bigger than all the chips involved, whereas an EMIB just has to be small. Intel's been working on this technology for well over a decade. And actually, we've only seen it in a few products so far, and only one product where the two die next to each other are really high powered. When you have two high high powered die next to each other with EMIB, you got to think about some of that, you know, flexing and bending and the material properties of everything involved. But Intel believes to have sold it. They're already selling an FPGA with two high powered die next to each other. And Sapphire Rapids will use 10 EMIBs, as shown in this picture, between the four compute die. So these are built on Intel's seven process or seven nanometer, whatever you want to call it, which was, you know, 10 enhanced super thin. We don't know how many cores they're going to have. We haven't been told that. However, these are each 400 square millimeters or just about to for a total of 1600 square millimeters. Now, Intel's whole shtick with its enterprise uh, platform is that the cores are arranged in a grid, in like a 2D grid, and then you have a mesh across the grid. And that's where your interconnect comes from. With these tiles, Intel has said, it, imagine a knife being cut through horizontally and vertically along that mesh. And that's where the EMIB connects through. Now, if you've noticed, there's technically four connections between tiles, you know, top to top, top to side, side, uh, bottom to bottom, bottom to top. I know what I mean, but basically, you would think that there'd be an equal number of EMIB connections between those two tiles. Intel has said that actually one direction has six EMIB connections, the other direction is four, because of the way the mesh works. Intel has said that each tile will have its cores, its uh, last level cache, but also it's going to have two 64-bit memory controllers, it's going to have some PCIe, it's going to have some I.O., and it's going to have some accelerators. So overall, with this chip, we're getting eight 64-bit channels of DDR5. We're getting some amount of PCIe. This is going to be PCIe 5. But also, this chip is going to support CXL. What Intel didn't say at Architecture Day, but they actually mentioned at Hot Chips, was that CXL MEM, the memory standard for CXL, is not going to be supported. So I'm not sure you can actually say if this chip is a full CXL support, CXL 1.1 support. That's going to be an interesting one to see how they market it. Then again, because CXL is still a nascent technology, we're not expecting to see that many devices built on it just quite yet. Now, don't get me wrong. There's been a lot of jokes being made about Intel's attitude to chiplets, attitude to tiles. Uh, there was one reference to glue back when uh, AMD launched Naples, although you could argue that glue logic is a thing. And here's the Wikipedia page for glue logic. But whatever your horse based binding agent is, between chiplets, between tiles. The whole point is that you can make your chips bigger than the single limit, single chip limits that most modern manufacturing processes have. That's about 820 square millimeters. So if you have lots of smaller chips connected together, then you can have what well, is essentially one big massive chip and you break through those silicon limits. So AMD's connectivity is done all through the package that has an associated power and bandwidth related to that. The better way to do it would be through an interposer, which is essentially what Intel is doing here. Intel is saying that their EMIB technology is so good and it's so low latency 
that the whole chip will act as if it's one big chip. Now, you still get subnumer clustering and all those fancy Xeon Enterprise features that you'd normally get with a big single die. But here, Intel is saying, just imagine it's one big chip. The problem is, Intel has a lot of customers that buy high-end, mid-range, and low-end. In previous years, it would have three different dies to do that. We'd have XCC, or extreme core count, HCC, high core count, and LCC, low core count. And the way they do this is just by having three separate dies. You can't really do that here. Intel has said that all Sapphire Rapid CPUs will have eight channels of DDR5 and all the PCIe lanes. But because you're spread, spreading that out across chiplets, either every processor has to have four chiplets or you're going to be doing something different. So what we might see here is your extreme core count use the standard four chiplets, as we've seen in the diagram. Your high core count may still use four chiplets, but some of those cores are fused off. When you get down to a low, co low core count, the sort of 16 core processors. It doesn't make sense to spend 1600 square millimeters of silicon for those products. So maybe Intel here might be doing a single monolithic design for the LCC with eight channels of DDR5 and all the PCIe and all the IO. We're going to see what happens. Intel really hasn't explained this that well at that level, but we'll see. That's my idea anyway. So for this design, Intel is using its new Golden Cove cores, which were announced with Alder Lake. What we're going to see here is pretty much exactly the same core. It's going to have that six wide decode engine, which is up 50% uh, from previous generations of Intel. That's going to be a big difference. Exactly how it works, we're still waiting for Intel to tell us. And then basically the whole pipe has been winded. More of everything, more page walkers, more re bigger reorder buffer, more execution ports. The L2 cache has increased. In Odd Lake, it's 1.25 megabytes. In, uh, in Sapphire Rapids, it's going to be two megabytes. They haven't stated what the L3 is going to be across the chip, because then we could work out how many cores it has. Though Intel has said it's going to be more than 100 megabytes on the biggest chips. For customers who might be in the right upgrade cycle for this, perhaps coming from Skylake or Haswell Broadwell platforms, you should expect to see anywhere between sort of like a 35 to 50 percent increase just on standard workloads, just an IPC. And then if you've got any fancy features like ABX 512, these might get a bump as well. Now, Intel for Sapphire Rapids is introducing AMX or Advanced Matrix Extensions, kind of like Tensor Cores, but not really, but kind of, and a new accelerator interface architecture to help for some of the specific issues that specific customers really want. The two other big features, I guess, that we should talk about with this is that Intel is basing Sapphire Rapids for single socket, dual socket, quad socket, and eight socket systems, and they've even got a new eight socket mode to help with the connectivity between all the CPUs, though very few people ever see an eight socket system in life. Um, Want to get hold of one? Let's see what happens. But the other feature to Sapphire Rapids is that there are going to be models with HBM memory. Now, we've already done a video on this, uh, should go up here, but what we learned is that the HBM will be connected by UMIB. Well, I guess we could have probably figured that out already. Though Intel gave conflicting information. So they have said that versions of Sapphire Rapids with HBM will be socket compatible with Sapphire Rapids. So that means that regular enterprise users should be able to get it. However, they also threw up this slide during hot chips. And I'll highlight the package size where it's saying that Sapphire Rapids XCC is one package size, and Sapphire Rapids XCC with HBM is a bigger package size, which means that they aren't on the same socket at all. Intel kind of weaseled itself a bit here. So what I think is happening is that if you want the highest core count processors with HBM, kind of like what's going into the Aurora supercomputer at the end of this year, beginning of next, then that's a separate socket on its own. If you want maybe the middle core count, the high core count, or the low core count with HBM, they may be coming in the same socket as that sort of XCC extreme core count version. But if unless Intel is fundamentally getting a custom size of HBM, and we show the diagram, they've got really thin HBM stacks. If you put that you know, side by side with the picture of, H of the XCC die, XCC package that we've seen, there's really no space to put those unless they're sort of those, those long, thin ones. So not really sure what's going on there with Intel. We're going to have to wait and see. We are still missing a lot of information on Sapphire Rapids. Core count, PCIe lanes, frequencies. Even though they said there's you know, eight 64-bit DDR5 controllers, we don't know what speed they're running at. 
Also, the time frame. Sapphire Rapids has been pushed back several times, not only because of delays to Intel's process, but as far as I understand it, you know, there's been some things that they've had to work out in the silicon as well. So exactly when it's come to market, when it's coming to the enterprise end user market is a bit of a quandary, is a bit of a question. Intel has confirmed that the Aurora supercomputer will be the first customer with Sapphire Rapids, and they're getting the special Sapphire Rapids with HBM versions. I fully suspect that it will take a roughly Q2 or end of Q1 where we're going to see Sapphire Rapids actually be properly launched, and then it'll ramp up through Q2 and Q3. When we get Sapphire Rapids with HBM for the rest of us, we'll probably be in that sort of Q3, Q4, Q5 timeframe 2022. So at the same time, what is AMD going to be doing? Well, AMD's kind of been teasing that Zen 4 will come next year, or it has said Zen 4 will come next year. And we're kind of expecting that the uh, epic versions of Zen 4 will come towards the end of 2022. By that time, Sapphire Rapids will kind of be ramping. However, there has been talk about this sort of Milan X version, where they're going to have you know third generation epics, Milan epics, with this AMD vCache technology. So you end up with up to 768 megabytes of L3 cache on Milan. We'll see if they come to market. We'll see if the rumors about them that are circulating actually happen. But what it does mean is that AMD has a trump card, it's essentially, that if Intel decides to come to the market with Sapphire Rapids earlier than expected, and it performs better than expected, then they can just throw up Milan X, um, though that will kind of eat in to uh, their TSMC wafer allocation. Because don't forget, if your chiplet, if your AMD chiplet is about 74 square millimeters, and then your vCache is another 36, you're essentially increasing the amount of silicon that goes into a processor by 50%. I will say that though on Sapphire Rapids, the big Skylake chips, you know, 660 square millimeters. Ice Lake, I don't think we have exact sizes, but maybe it's around that. If your big Sapphire Rapids are now 1600 square millimeters of silicon, even if you put in the same amount of wafers and you've got the same amount of yield, you're using more than double the amount of silicon and that's going to eat into your volume. So, we do have to wonder here, how effective will Intel be in this quartile strategy? Personally, I think the tiles as they stand, I mean, if you do some of the rotation, I mean, I was meant to be ending this video, but I'll end up talking about more. The way silicon works is you can't just map, you can't just reflect your mask and try and put it onto the silicon that way because of the way the uh, silicon crystal structure is. What Intel has had to do is do two versions of its compute tiles and essentially rotate them 180 degrees. It's like rotational symmetry. What AMD did when it launched its first generation epics is that it had that one Zeppelin die that it could just rotate. You ended up having on each Zeppelin die four inter-die connections, even though there was only three other dies on the chip. So you always left one blank, but they were always in the right position that regardless of how you rotate, rotated it, you could still do a die-to-die -die connection. Intel hasn't done that. So they're going to be having to manage what, exactly how many tiles of each that come through the yielding process and adjust for that. But personally, I think Intel has missed a trick here. AMD kind of really hit it on the, hit it on the head with their centralized IO die and just having core chiplets, core tiles, whatever you want to call them, just external to the IO die. Intel is going to have to move to some sort of strategy like that in the future especially if they want to make sure that they have versions of their chips with fewer cores, but all the same PCI lanes and all the same memory channels. That's one up that AMD has here. Now AMD's on its third generation or second, third generation chiplet design. Intel's still on its first. And we're going to have to see if Intel's ready, prepared, already put into design, because I'm pretty sure the next generation Xeon is pretty much done design in the middle of uh, getting designed properly in silicon. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens on that side of the fence come 2023, 2024 with Intel, and also how AMD is going to push forward over its new text, new over its two next generations that way as well. My main specification here is that I can't wait to get into test, really. I want to see how these tiles work, what the latencies are between them, and if there's any difference in delay. Uh, and we'll see whether putting things through EMIB, through 10 EMIBs, is actually more power efficient than what AMD is doing through the package. It should be on paper, 
but it also depends on the manufacturing process and all the integration that goes in. So good luck Intel. We'll see what happens with the results. If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it'll instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support.